Hi, I'm John Downing. I'm a limnologist and aquatic ecologist, and this is session 18 of a course in limnology and aquatic ecology. And this session is on the origin and diversity of aquatic plants or aquatic macrophytes, um, more specifically. Um, I have several objectives in giving this um, presentation. And uh, first off, um, I'd like to review the biology and evolution of plants in general, because you may wonder where these things come from. Uh, we've already talked about the phytoplankton and uh, various kinds of very small primary producers. And now we'll be talking about the larger ones. And so it is germane to think about how we get two very different kinds of aquatic plants in these inland water ecosystems. The next thing I'd like to do is distinguish the biology of the cyanobacteria, the algae, and vascular plants, and think briefly about that. And then I'd like to present and discuss the diverse forms of aquatic macrophytes in various aquatic ecosystems. And in those, we'll go sort of from the riparian um, or semi-wetland uh, sorts of um, uh, ecosystems down into the deeper waters. And then we'll examine the biodiversity in the aquatic flowering plants, which are really the largest group of aquatic, um, uh, aquatic macrophytes. So in order to kind of think about where uh, these uh, aquatic plants came from, we have to talk about the origins of photosynthesis, I think. The first photosynthetic organisms were aquatic, of course, because it was this great soup covering the planet of uh, various stuff. And the first photosynthetic organisms were probably photosynthetic bacteria and things like cyanobacteria, which are, in fact, photosynthetic bacteria. Um, the photosynthetic bacteria have bacterial chlorophyll. And the cyanobacteria that are a little bit different have chlorophyll A and a variety of other pigments. In fact, in the earlier sessions talking about things like light, we talked about the billy proteins. We talked about that also when we discussed um, the, the kinds of primary producers you find in the plankton. So the origins of life, I mean, we should just kind of review this and then just look to see where the where the plants came from. The prebiotic earth conditions were various noxious atmospheric gases, including ammonia, a very aggressive, nasty gas, methane, which most of you probably know something about, lots of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And there was basically an, ac uh, an absence of free oxygen with some ozone formed in various ways. Um, the postulate is that there was intense lightning and ultraviolet radiation. And in, in fact, you can, if you put those kinds of materials together in a reactor and, <coughs> excuse me, and give it some electrical charge and ultraviolet, you know, this spontaneous formation of organic molecules. And this uh, science goes way back. And I remember as a kid walking through a university biolo biology department, seeing people doing these experiments of, of, uh, with great big glass things with aluminum foil on them and zapping them electricity trying to create sort of proto-life. And in fact, this works in the formation of various kinds of random sorts of organic molecules. These chemical building blocks then were, therefore, were present. And you can form things like amino acids, sugars, lipids, nucleotide bases, and uh, even sort of things like ATP. Um, these organic molecules rained into the oceans then, creating an organic soup within that aqueous solution. And then the thought is that there was probably a great deal of polymerization. And this w uh, led to the development of proto-life. Um, early life forms utilized compounds in the surrounding soup of material. And, and eventually, these orga organic compounds were in short supply. And the reason the organic compounds were important was because those bond energies in the organic compounds um, were uh, fairly rich and could be metabolized or in various ways in order to remove that bond energy and sustain life. Then we can expect that there was probably some degree of competition and natural selection going on so that those that were could work the best could survive and perhaps even reproduce better. So using light energy was really a means of avoiding competition for ATP and other things in the environment. And probably there was a fairly scant amount of it in the environment. And um, the atmosphere had no ozone. So ultra ultraviolet radiation was extremely intense. And it's this loss of the ozone that we're concerned about now with climate change because of one of the reasons, of course, is the very big increase in ultraviolet, also very 
big increase in, um, in other kinds of uh, radiation that cause heating. Ultraviolet destroys chlorophyll molecules and other kinds of molecules too. So photosynthetic organisms uh, probably survived best in aquatic environments. And when we talked about light and light absorbance, uh, you probably recall that um, uh, the, ultra the absorbance of radiation in the upper layers of water um, are very intense with respect to the absorbance of ultraviolet radiation. So then photosynthesis probably began to originate and the first autotrophs were photosynthetic bacteria and cyanobacteria and there's fossil evidence um, going back a really a long way and these are stromatolites. You, you find living stromatolites today and I'll show you a photograph of them and these are big sorts of colonies of, of material that are very, very ancient indeed going back about three and a half billion years in the history of Earth. Here's some foss fossilized um, stromatolites along Lake Superior. This is in the Gunflint Chert. Uh, any of you who've toured around that area may have run into it. You can see this circular colonial structure. And here are some living ones in Shark Bay, uh, Northwest Australia. So um, if you search on the web, you'll find quite a lot on stromatolites. They are some of the most endangered organisms on the planet. And I've even found some pretty small ones in um, inland waters, in um, uh, in lakes, in particular areas, in particular areas with um, high nutrient and high salt seeps. The consequences of photosynthesis were pretty severe for the environment back then, if you can imagine, because there's a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of water, and there's light. And then, if you think about the equation for um, photosynthesis, there's probably the formation of sugars or other complex molecules, giving rise then to some free oxygen, uh, atmospheric oxygen. Oxygen accumulated in the atmosphere and actually would have been uh, considered sort of toxic in a way. Um, and then ozone began to block ultraviolet because of the, the formation of ozone. Terrestrial environments then could be colonized because no, no longer wasn't absolutely necessarily necessary to be totally um, um, protected from ultraviolet radiation because it is, was blocked by ozonation of the atmosphere. And then aerobic respiration could actually evolve based on this pollutant of oxygen that came into the atmosphere due to the evolution of photosynthesis. So that's kind of where these photosynthetic organisms, this is where we think they came from now. Um, but then where do the algae come from? Because all we've gotten to so far are basically cyanobacteria and photosynthetic bacteria. And this, uh, the important theory in this regard, or one of them, is, was uh, advanced by Lynn Margulis in the 1980s. And uh, this is called the endosymbiotic theory of evolution of algae. And um, the, the idea is um, uh, that this was a symbiotic, um, uh, that, uh, and, uh, sorry, that um, um, eukaryotic organisms probably evolved from a symbiosis. So the thought is that mitochondria and chloroplasts were probably the result of evolution initiated by the endocytosis of bacteria and blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. And endocytosis means inside the cell. So, um, so uh, bacteria and blue-green algae engulfed by other cells, which instead of being digested or as assimilated by the cells, then became symbiotic um, and could offer um, different kinds of services to those cells. The endosymbiotic theory explains the different lineages of algae, basically. So uh, in the evolution uh, from cyanobacteria to green algae, it was first, uh, it's, so it's believed that first the cyanobacteria were the precursors to the chloroplasts, and then eukaryotic organisms may have engulfed the cyanobacteria, or somehow the cyanobacteria became endosymbiotic. And then the green algae were evolved, and the evidence uh, for the evolution of green algae from endosymbiosis is in the pigments and membranes, membrane structure of the green algae. And these things are found in one, uh, in, uh, one line of green algae that gave rise also then to the terrestrial plants. One line, the green algae, are thought to have given rise to the terrestrial plants. From then on, um, it, uh, we need to be thinking about then, because we've already talked about algae and cyanobacteria in previous sessions, 
And where do these higher, so-called higher plants come from? And um, the thought is that they came from these green algae because they include the same photosynthetic pigments, and those would be chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids, and um, a, a, other, a few other uh, kinds. Of, well, those are the main ones anyway. They also have the same membrane structure of the chloroplasts, and uh, they also both, uh, green algae and higher plants, uh, both um, uh, include fragmoplast cell division. This is only really seen in one lineage of green algae and in higher plants. So that's the thought, um, that it wasn't just coincidental, that in fact one evolved from the other. Now you may wonder what a phycoplast a phycoplast, uh, uh, and phragmoplast uh, cell division are. And in phragmoplast uh, division, uh, during cell division, the phragmoplast is a set of short microtubules, and you can see these phragmoplasts here that are oriented parallel to the spindle uh, mic microtubules. And it, um, and and basically, the difference in the uh, between phragmoplast division and phycoplast uh, division is the different orientation of the various tubules with respect to the cell plate. And these are ways in which we sort of trace back the lineages of evolution of plants, uh, higher plants, and the green algae. Now, the green algae. Um, uh, and green algae are uh, are sort of um, a complicated group because they not only contain um, uh, things that would look very much like a green alga, but as we learned earlier um, in uh, earlier sessions, it includes a couple of the green algae uh, contains a couple of genera, Cara and Nutella, that look very much like a vascular plant, except they're lacking in vascular tissue. Uh, Cara is called skunkwort and You've probably seen things like this in aquatic ecosystems, and these are simply algae or macrophytic green algae that grow in these systems, but they look very, very much like the organization of some kind of higher plant. So the plant kingdom is very diverse, of course, and uh, the thought is that photosynthetic organisms, of, as I said before, first arose in aquatic organisms, and this probably uh, was embodied by the cyanobacteria and photosynthetic bacteria because of the protection from ultraviolet radiation in aquatic environments. And al algae are primarily aquatic organisms. You do find them a little bit in terrestrial um, environments, but the thought is then that vascular plants developed in terrestrial environments. Uh, developed almost entirely in terrestrial uh, environments as an evolutionary offshoot of the vascular, uh, sorry, of the algae. The aquatic vascular plants then, the thought currently is um, that they, um, uh, that the current vascular, aquatic vascular plants have ancestors that were terrestrial but later recolonized aquatic habitats. And, and uh, I think the science goes back and forth on this depending on various um, molecular genetic work. Um, but it's not entirely resolved, but the thought is, the uh, current thought, I think, dominant thought is that aquatic vascular plants um, basically came back into aquatic ecosystems from the terrestrial environment. Now, um, in plant evolution, well, the, the plants that we're going to talk about are in several different groups, and there are several groups that are represented in the aquatic flora, uh, flora meaning plants. They are the flowering plants that you're familiar with, the conifers, ferns, quillworts, horsetails, liverworts, and mosses. And I thought it might be useful for us to look through each of these kinds of plants um, in sequence so that you can uh, see what kinds of plants are actually uh, involved in the aquatic macrophytic vegetation. First off, um, there, are, um, there are several divisions within the kingdom plantae. And uh, the ones that are colored in blue here are those that are uh, represented in aquatic systems. And they would be the hepatocophyta, the bryophyta, lycophyta, sphenophyta, terid uh, teridophyta, and the pinophyta. Some of, some of the different kinds of, or, of uh, plants are not represented in aquatic ecosystems uh, really at all. Oh, and I left out the magnoliophyta, which are the flowering plants, of which are the most species. Um, uh, em, uh, embracing something like a quarter of a million different species of plants. It's just a, a stunning variety, and we, um, it seems like every year um, we, um, uh, the science, science discovers more and more species 
uh, flowering plants uh, across the planet. So um, we can talk about these each in sequence, and we'll kind of start um, a, a, along this list, or sort of following this list. So in the hepatica phyta, the, the growth form is very flattened, and, and this means liverwort, um, the, the hepatic, uh, um, hepatitis refers to the liver, right? So um, it's uh, the hepatica phyta uh, are sort of a liver, or thought, were thought to be sort of liver-like. The growth form is flattened. They're dichotomously branching thalli, um, and I'll show you pictures in just a second. And they mostly grow in moist, not absolutely, um, well, yeah, they can live totally in aquatic environments too, and, I, and we'll see a couple of them. There's Richia and Richiocarpus. So this is Richia, and you can see it kind of will form mats in aquatic systems. This is in a laboratory setting, and this is slender Richia. These liverworts form tangled masses of thin, dichotomously branching leaves that float at or below the water surface. So they are found in the water, but also found in very moist habitats. And another one, Richiocarpus, uh, this is pur purple fringe richia. These liverworts have pretty thick leaves and with long purplish scales on the underside that, that resemble short roots. And you can kind of see that root-like material um, sort of sticking out the bottom of these leaf-like structures. So this would be richia carpus. The next group I'd like to talk about are the bryophytes or mosses. And we'll learn in a little bit that the bryophytes are in a subsequent session, I think, actually that the bryophytes are, are um, some of the macrophytes that are found to the, the greatest depths in aquatic ecosystems. Now, they have no true stems, leaves, or roots, and they basically have no really specialized tissue. There's a sporophyte. The, the sporophyte is not always present. The sporophyte is partially dependent on the gametophyte. Here we see the mature gametophyte. And the gametophyte is photosynthetic, and it's the photosynthetic perennial sort of structure, and it absorbs water and nutrients directly into the tissues. Uh, so this is kind of in uh, what a moss looks like. Many of you are probably uh, pretty familiar with mosses in the area in which you live, almost always in very moist habitats, and uh, very um, a difficult, it would be difficult for them to control um, evap evapotranspiration very well. But this is kind of what they look like. Um, the, there are four kinds of uh, aquatic mosses that are pretty important. There's sphagnum, ephysidens, fontanalis, and drepanocladus. And we'll see a few pictures. This is sphagnum, and this is you find in peat bogs. It's, it has a huge, high water, a hugely high water holding capacity. And this material is actually mined, the dead peat is mined and ground up and then used in gardening to increase the water retention of soils. And it also re, uh, releases hydrogen ions, which makes most systems in which it lives um, uh, pretty acidic. So if you've been around a bog at all, then you know that these are fairly brown. They're releasing a lot of dissolved organic carbon. They're also pretty low in pH, and so the, the, um, system is pr the systems are pretty acidic. But they're also very good at holding on to water. These form uh, floating mats across the surface of bogs and around um, around uh, wetland areas and small lakes. Here's Drepanocladus, another example. This is a it, it, this is a growth form. This is a submersed macrophyte, and because they really don't have vascular tissue, um, the um, these mosses can exist down at very great depths compared to other um, other kinds of vascular plants. Um, the next group I'd like to talk about are the lycophyta, the quillworts, and they look pretty much like sort of normal plants, um, but they, but the leaf like it's a sort of an unbranched leaf structure, and they are kind of quill shaped, as you can see, sort of pointed. They have a very cosmopolitan distribution and exist around, um, around uh, within the shallow waters of softwater lakes, those without. Uh, really, a lot of dissolved um, uh, dissolved um, uh, salts in them. Um, they produce spores inside the leaf bases, and this is what they look like: the lycophyta or quillworts. The next group are really quite fascinating and very ancient. These are the sphenophyta or the horsetails. There's basically only one genus, and this is Equisetum, um, which of course means uh, something like uh, tail tail of the horse, right? And um, if you've been around water very much, you've probably seen some of these. Um, these are, um, they, uh, they, they are sometimes called scrubbing rush. 
because the um, uh, they're very good for scrubbing pots, pots and pans, for example, if you're if you're camping. Although in a lot of areas these are becoming endangered and disappearing <clears throat> for one reason or another, but um, they are very very rich in silicates or, or glass particles, and um, and you can feel it if you feel these things. They um, are very sort of crisp in texture. And um, if you see those joints on the long pieces of the horsetails, they snap apart. So they have a very segmented nature. They look almost like a, a mini bamboo. Um, and they're uh, so interestingly jointed that you can actually make chains and rings and things out of their of their stems, although possibly you should make sure if they're, that they're not in danger before you do anything like that. They're v they have very rudimentary leaves and roots. And it's a very, well, it has been a very common emergent plant. The next group I want to talk about would be the pteridophytes, or ferns. And they are, ha, pro, possess true stems, leaves, and roots. So they have <coughs> fairly di um, um, uh, differentiated sorts of tissue. And we'll talk about Marsilia, Zola, and Salvinia as um, groups of the pteridophytes. Here's Marsilia. It's called water clover. It's quite a pretty delicate plant. Um, it's usually an emergent, a rooted emergent growth habit, although sometimes you'll find it um, right out on shore, not emerging from the water. Um, it, um, it lives in shallow water or moist soil. Very beautiful, delicate little plant, and, and this is actually a fern. Azola is another one. This is, it has a floating uh, growth form. You can see it's very complex sort of leaf leaf structure and it's um it has a symbiotic cyanobacter which is called anabina azole um and that um uh lives within the lives within the structure of the plant and uh, this is very common in a uh, rice paddy culture here you see a lot of azola um in a rice paddy and um one of the neat things about azole is that it like many other cyanobacteria as we learned earlier talking about um, the phytoplankton. Uh, many can fix nitrogen, and this one is no different. It fixes, um, it can uh, fix nitrogen with this cyanobacteria, Anabina azole, and that allows it to enrich the nitrogen in the paddy culture. And here's Salvinia. Um, this is a floating growth form. It has very, um, it has um, hair-like structures that stick up on the surface, and you see these beads of water uh, standing up on the surface of the leaves, and this is caused by the physical structure of the uh, of the leaf. Uh, again, Salvinia, another uh, floating fern. Next, I'd like to talk about the pinophyta or conifers, and some of you may think that's really silly that pines are not aquatic macrophytes, but in fact, there are many of them that live specifically in very aquatic habitats, mostly in riparian areas or wetlands of one kind or another. But these are seed-bearing plants, as you probably know, because they have cones that have seeds in them. They, their um, secondary growth um, uh, yields woody tissues, and the growth forms uh, would be trees and shrubs of varying kinds in the pinophyta. The four different groups that we'll talk about briefly would be taxodium, which would be the bald cypress, Larix, which are tamarack, uh, Thuya occidentalis, which is uh, the white cedar, and uh, black spruce, Picea mariana. Here's Taxodium, the bald cypress, uh, a beautiful deciduous uh, plant that uh, tree that is uh, pretty common in uh, uh, in the southeast United States in in swamplands, and um, it um, is quite a quite a remarkable plant. It'll grow uh, in as far north as about 45, sorry, about 43 degrees north latitude, something like that, in North America at least. So the bald cypress. Here are the tamarack, and you may have seen the tamarack. It's another deciduous conifer. It's common in northern bog lands. On the left-hand side, you see the uh, beautiful um, um, uh, leaf structure, and they have tiny, tiny cones, and they produce seed that's among the most valuable conifer seed. Uh, in the world because it's so hard to collect and so very small. Um, you can see how they turn this bright, absolutely gorgeous yellow in the autumn as they lose their leaves and then regrow um, their needle-like um, leaf structures um, in the springtime. So often when you go past a bog in the winter, if you live in the um, uh, if you live in the temperate zone, you'll notice that there are a lot of dead-looking trees. They're not always dead. Um, sometimes they've just lost their leaves for the winter. <clears throat>
And here we have the white cedar. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this. It's quite a common ornamental plant as well. Uh, its range is in northern U.S. and Canada, and it forms white cedar swamps. And it also is really common in riparian vegetation. Here you see white cedar along the edge of this lake, and this lake is obviously in the temperate zone and forms ice um, because you can see the deer browse line across here, very straight, and they can only browse up the cedars so far before they fail to be able to reach. And so quite frequently as you're uh, going past some of these cedars, you'll see a very sharp demarcation line, um, which is probably due in, uh, to deer browsing. And finally, uh, for the pinophyta would be um, the uh, black spruce. And its range is also in the northern U.S. and Canada, at least in North America. It grows at the edges of bogs, ponds, and lakes. And here you see a beautiful black spruce on the edge of a lake. And um, they're very dark in color and, and quite narrow in aspect, um, rarely uh, very full. The final group would be the magnolia phyta. These are the flowering plants. And they're the largest taxonomic group in the plant kingdom and comprise about a quarter of a million different species uh, that's growing every year. They have a very advanced reproductive uh, 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 system, and the structures would be then flowers and fruits with seeds in them and so on. So uh, as you're probably familiar, most um, many, many of our, well, of course, our flowering plants are belonging to the magnolia phyta. Now, um, the, uh, in the evolution of aquatic plants, the hydrophytes the, or macrophytes then became polyphyletic, meaning many different groups. There's no single lineage that exists for the aquatic plants. Um, and uh, in, um, in the, one of the landmark works on the biology of uh, aquatic vascular plants, Skull, Skullthorpe listed 28 families uh, having aquatic species, and, and, um, and this is out of uh, 350 plant, uh, plant families extant. So a 28, so it's polyphyletic, the aquatic plants are, uh, and um, came from about 28 different lineages. Here are some kinds of growth forms of the aquatic plants, and they belong to various groups, um, and um, as uh, is indicated by their names. But um, first thing we should think about with respect to these is they have three major growth form sorts of uh, approaches. They are the emergent, the floating-leaved, and the submersed. And these you'll see down the left-hand side. Now, the emergent macrophytes live in the water-saturated submersed soils from uh, the saturation zone to about a meter and a half, although I tell you I've seen them grow deeper than that. Some of the examples that you might be familiar with would be the bulrush and cattail. Um, that can be, as you probably know, pretty large. Their annual production is really high, and we'll talk about that in just uh, in a subsequent session where we learn why it is um, plants, it, emergent plants, have such a phenomenal rate of primary production. But it can be from, and in dry, this is in dry mass, um, 10 grams to 10 kilos per square meter per year. 10 kilos per square meter per year is really a lot of dry mass production. Um, fairly spectacular. Now, the floating leaf macrophytes. If you're, if you followed the work of um, of Monet, the painter, or or others, you're probably familiar with uh, things uh, called um, water lilies. And these floating leaf plants, uh, including water lilies, are principally angiosperms, um, sort of uh, seed-bearing plants, found at depths uh, to about three meters depth. Um, uh, for those of you who don't do metric, it's about 10 feet or so. The leaves float at the surface, and, and some of the examples would be Nufar, Nymphae, that'd be the uh, yellow um, water lily and the white water lily, and then duckweed, which are very, very small, much smaller than the other floating leaf plants. There are also some, um, some um, oh, um, submersed uh, aquatic macrophytes that have a floating leaf structure. Some of the Potamogeton or pondweeds uh, also will have a floating leaf uh, structure. Um, and so um, these have a, a little bit lower annual primary production from about 10 grams to oh, one and a half kilos per square meter per year in growth in dry mass. And so a little bit lower than those phenomenally productive emergent plants. The submersed aquatic macrophytes um, are, are, again, just a, a little bit less productive. But these are um, principally angiosperms and caraphytic algae. 
although I mentioned a little while ago that there are some mosses that will grow to very great depth in clear enough ecosystems, the leaves are almost always submersed, and this will include a, a large number of the pondweeds or potamogetans and uh, many other things. Um, you may recognize names like coontail or milfoil or elodea as a common um, common plant sold for aquaria, um, vallisneria, corkscrew a plant some people call it, or duck celery. Um, I'm not very good on common names, much better with the, the Latin ones, but it includes a lot of different groups. And you can see several images of these over here, and some may seem familiar to you if you've spent much time around aquatic ecosystems. Annual production, as I said, just a little bit lower, down 10 grams to about a kilo per square meter per year. So it's still substantially productive, and I've found it actually higher than a kilo, a couple of kilos per square meter per year in lakes that are very, very nutrient rich. So thinking again about the um, uh, origin and diversity of aquatic plants and sort of the, to summarize the information from this session in total, the aquatic macrophytes evolved from cyanobacteria and algae via the green algae. Um, and then they, grow, they formed a polyphyletic group that re, uh, re-engaged aquatic environments. So they uh, actually, the thought is that they were, um, that they, that uh, vascular plants reinvaded aquatic plants from, uh, from the terrestrial environment um, after evolution in that environment. Some of the macrophytic plants are non-vascular algae, actually, things like Cara, um, uh, Cara and Nutella, and there are also some bryophytes. Aquatic plants include a bunch of different things, the liverworts, the mosses, uh, club mosses, quillworts, horse, horse tails, ferns, conifers, and the flowering plants and the magnolia phyta, the flowering plants, are by far the most diverse group.